the box seat, brought to you by our stable of sponsors. Hi everyone, welcome to this edition of Your Box Seat. Yes, it is brought to you by our stable of sponsors. Michael Guerin, we're honing in on the Auckland Cup, the 2024 edition. Whilst numerically, it's a little bit light, still got a bit of depth to it. It's Cup Week, that's the key to it. That means we've got a massive night with two Group 1 3,000 tournament metre races. It's the only time of the year we have them, two of them on the same night, and there's a lot of chat floating around our industry about where this Auckland Cup sits. Should it be on May 24th, Gregory? I think pretty firmly from the fact that neither Merlin or Don't Stop Dreaming aren't there. The answer is pretty obvious, but the question is, if it doesn't go here, where do we put it? Let's talk about that more as we get into the show today, even though, Gregory Pizzali, the uh, loss of Don't Stop Dreaming has left us, with, left us with a more even Auckland Cup. Yeah, absolutely it has. So what can you expect on your box seat? Uh, we'll get into a review and preview. Last week, this week, Group 1s, and there was one at Addington as well. Muscle Mountain, with no just believe, uh, got back on uh, top winning the Anzac. We lost one of the greats of our sport, uh, a owner, a Leviathan owner in uh, Terry McDonald. John Dunn gets the chocolates with Got the Chocolates uh, in the Group 1 welcome stakes out of Addington. Betton Wynn is making his way to Queensland and he won again at Addington. Uh, it's Timaru Winter Cup Day and it's the New Zealand Bloodstock Weanling Sales. Yes, 106 of those uh, going under the hammer on Thursday afternoon. But let's go back to Alexandra Park. We spoke of Group 1 racing. Here was uh, the Group 1 size stakes with Magnus Benro, Duchess Megs it, courtesy of the scratching. It was all you need is me earlier in the week. Went around a dollar twenty favourite and did this. Racy girl, seventy five left to go. Duchess Megs it need to be shook up in the last two hundred, but she'll cruise to Group One success. Duchess Megs it, ultimate racy girl, Queen of Swords. A photo there. Just was professional, and you got away with it tonight. Yeah, I'm going to slap myself on the wrist for that. Um, driving too pretty, I think. Uh, they come swishing, especially Scotty. Uh, Sort of give me a little bit of a fright there about the 180, but uh, she just pulled away. Like everything she does is so strong. I felt like if I'd gone quicker, I would have won by more. Which you know, like I said, I'll slap myself on the wrist, and next time we won't uh, put it to chance. You know, she's probably the best filly in the country at the moment. Hopefully, she can uh, hold that for the next couple of years. But um, yeah, yeah, we'll see how we get on. But don't be too harsh on yourself. I mean, it was, was it a case of also, I think, once she saw the other filly come, you kind of steered her out to get her eye of her that she came back underneath you? A hundred percent, yeah. When she saw her, she sort of clicked into that next gear. And even down the back, um, when I think it was Josh got outside of me, just she hits another level and just picks that bit up and just feels like a monster. And, you know, I should have just let her go at the six. <laughs> I, I honestly, she gives you that feel like if I just rolled along a little bit more, I probably would have won by sort of three or four lengths and done it pretty comfortable. So... It's uh, something to keep in mind for the future, but like anything, it's building blocks, isn't it? You, you've got to make sure they're not having hard runs all the time, and uh, she's definitely a filly on the rise. You're pinching yourself, you're driving Cold Chisel, you're driving Merlin, you're driving Duchess Megs at two-year-old trotters. doesn't stop. Oh, honestly, so lucky. Big thanks to this team here, Barry Scotty, and, and all the hard work they do. Like, it's, uh, it's not often you get one nice one to drive, and I'm um, yeah, so blessed to, to have the stock that I've got, and... You know, they keep putting me back on, so I just really want to thank them and, and show my appreciation for what they do for me. Gee, you gave the favourite a bit of a fright there, Scotty. Yeah, I reckon I had a more day about the 200 for about five metres. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was a good run and, um, you know, it was great for Baron Katrina, her owner, and um, a bit more money in the till anyway. She's a little bit underrated, isn't she? She's been in a lot of Group 1 races where she's been really competitive and kind of knocked one off yet. Yeah, exactly right. You know, she she's, she's up there, but just not quite like the two top fillies have been so um, hopefully she'll get there one day. What do you do with her now? Uh, look she'll probably go for a break now and um, you know probably follow the same path as Duchess unfortunately but um, you know she'll always be there that's for sure. She's pretty good ultimate racy girl but Michael it's pretty simple Duchess Megs it is just better. Yeah and I think she, she might actually be the best of this crop I don't know and I, I don't want to be disparaging to the, the Northern Oaks winner because she's really good 
but I get the feeling this horse is more unfurnished. It gives us something really interesting to look forward to in the second half of the season. I, I think the best version of Duchess Megs, it's going to be sitting off a really hot speed. I think already she's got the the body and the natural ability to be a sub-150 horse doing that. She reminds me a little bit of Artie's Express, one of those horses who clearly the first time you see them, you go, wow, this thing can run. And then it's a matter of how, how they hold together, I think, Gregory. And remarkable run it's been for Scott Phelan and Barry Purdom. We've touched on that. I did a story last week for the Herald and Harness Race in New Zealand. When you list what they've won since they won uh, the Derby uh, and the two of Phillies race on Grand Prix Day. Almost every weekend they've contested a major race, they've, they've won one. They've, there's been a couple of weekends they haven't. Cold Chisels had a couple of placings and a couple of weekends they haven't contested major races. But it's been a remarkable run and, and they can win the cup this week. So very good filly, looking forward to seeing how they all marry up at the back end of the season. But if you had a the third or fourth best filly, Greg, it'd be really, really tempting to start shopping them around because the top two are clearly very, very good. Yeah, absolutely they are. Let's leave that Group 1 there and uh, go to the Trillion Trust Auckland Cup. The key lead-up race, of course, was the Roy Purden, the third running of his memorial race. In front, American Me, Sarah O'Reilly. We've seen that combination get it done at Group 1 level before over 3,200. They get another chance this week here. She is, with him, winning the Roy Purden. We'll get some post-race reaction from them. American Me, great win off the top. Self-assured second and third over Old Town Road. Sarah, that must have given you a massive thrill, dictating in front and kicking away the way he did. Yep, pretty happy about it. Um, he hadn't had much luck in his couple of runs here before um, this race. He was just getting a bit too far back, which was no fault of his own, and still running on good. So we were back to his favourite standing starts today, and he made the most of it. He's one of those horses when he get, when he gets into a rhythm, and we know he's such a strong front running horse. I mean, the Invercargill Group One victory showed you that he's up to betting horses like Self Assured, and having that handicap advantage was a big advantage tonight. Yeah, it was tonight. Um, he made a great beginning. Um, I'm still not too sure what was happening out the back. I just heard a lot of yelling in that, but um, yeah, he gets into his rhythm. He's not a sharp sprinter, but he can go all day. So yeah, that's his key. Obviously heading into next week, we step up with a longer trip, which will even suit him more. Uh, the staying test, we know he's such a good star. Yeah, no, um, it should suit him very good. Um, he won the Invercargill Cup over that distance, so there should be no problems there, and just hoping for a nice draw. Mark, he's got another tradesman-like run again tonight, hitting nine strongly. Yes, he did. Made a great beginning too, Craig, and yeah, <laughs> uh, he ended up running home strongly, so very pleased with him. So heading into the Auckland Cup next week, um, he's a proven two-miler, just won't be a problem with him, and he kind of, he's just doing enough to, to suggest that he, he's got another Group 1 win in him. Yeah, for sure, you know, I, th I think that too, and I think, you know, just giving him the right run, and uh, uh, no bad luck, he'd be, he'd be right there again. Okay. John, I think it was probably a perfect run leading into the Auckland Cup next week. Yeah, it was a perfect run, um, Craig, apart from missing away, which were a little bit concerning. He's, he generally doesn't do that, but um, his overall performance, I think, was terrific, yep. What did Josh say after the run? Did he have a bit of a blow, and, and he felt like he ran through the line? He he, uh, he did, Craig, but he actually felt he just come to the end of about 50 out, um, which I I expected him to, but I expect him to be a much fitter horse next week, and um, he only needs that one run. I've said it before, one run and clean, very, very clean winner horse. It's all about doing it right next week and stepping up over the longer trip, but that should suit him. Oh, I, I don't think any distance worries him, Craig, honestly, do. Yeah, going away is the biggest thing, but I, it, it's a bit of a concern what he did tonight, but having said that in the past, he's generally been pretty good. Yeah, I spoke to uh, John Dickey this afternoon, Michael. He said he's come through the race brilliantly. You heard what he said there about him being clean-winded. I'm not worried about the two miles. He's already gone a great race in the New Zealand Cup when he was only having his 12th or 13th start. Um, I, th I think he'll take some beating this week. I think he will. So we'll go back to the start of that clip. First of all, America Me, wonderful for the Whites. Uh, and for Sarah, um, it's, it's really hard to come north, not just for the trainers, but also for Sarah. A lot of drivers struggle when they come north early in their careers. I know she's been here a couple of times to drive in the junior champs and won, but it's still not easy 
to come here and, and get it right. Um, so that was wonderful for them. Uh, I don't think he should have been off the front in that race. I know it was based purely on ratings, but you can see how some people would go, well, why was he off the front and he's won a Group 1? And Old Town Road and Republican Party, who have never been close to winning a Group 1, were off 10 metres. I know it's based on ratings, but it sort of makes a bit of a nonsense of Group 1s, really. If you win one, and Republican Party, who's never won a decent race in his life, really, I think he's won a 30, 40,000. You won a junior free for all. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Which is irrelevant. Yep. So, and then the standing start wasn't pretty good. Um, for the Republican Party, he's, he's featuring a lot of this conversation. He didn't go very well anyway, but he got flattened at the start. I thought it was a messy standing start at best. Away from all that, America Me, fantastic. So that's great. He might have still won from 10 metres because he began so quickly. Uh, self assured was really good. We'll talk about his cup chances in a second because he's been backed into cup favouritism. Old Town Road, excellent. Wasn't too concerned by the fact that he missed away because he was fresh. And secondly, I like it if a horse is going to miss away. Once the other horses have gone past him, if they stop and, and, and they stop galloping and, and pace, that's always a good sign because it means they want to pace. And once that nervous energy is out of their system, they're happy to pace. It's when they keep galloping you've got a problem. So I think he'll be better this week, and, and a smallish field means it shouldn't be too claustrophobic there on the front line. I thought Better Eclipse was okay, Greg. I'm speaking, speaking to Greg Sugars. He's given me an indication maybe he's coming to the end of it, but I think following the speed, he gets his chance this week. Can go, I would struggle to see him win. Alter Meteor is a new horse to the race. He's going to be really interesting after being so good in the country cups. Um, and the Republican Party, I don't think, is going good enough, even though absolutely nothing has gone right for him this campaign, Greg. So, look, I think, I think it's a fun Auckland Cup. It's absolutely disappointing we don't have Millwood Nike and Merlin speak the truth of clearly not racing uh, and don't stop dreaming. That's disappointing. But We've got Mark Shard. Mark Shard's there. My apologies. I forgot Mark Shard and, and G1C, Group 1 Crystal. <laughs> um, <laughs> Absolutely. And if you'd only ever seen the last month of racing in the North Island, you'd think Mark Sharp was a certainty because he's been so good. So my apologies to Shardy for forgetting him. So I think it's a really even cup, Greg. I think it's got heaps of really cool storylines, quite a few fairy tales, including the fact that, of course, since the first cup was run in 1890, no horse has ever won three Auckland Cups. And self-assured gets his chance to do that this week and in many ways put an exclamation mark on his career. So... I think this cup has to move. This one's not going to move this week, obviously. But I think it needs to go closer to the race by Grins. I can't think we need to worry too much about the Australians because the bottom line is only two Australians turned up to the race by Grins this year. And one was $25 and one was $9. So we can't just put races on for them. But we do have to put them in an envelope where they're at least happy to consider them. Um, and then I think that means if we went to, say, the back end of April, Greg, then people would say, OK, we can still give our horses the whole of May off if we want to, and a little bit of June, and go through that traditional New Zealand Cup campaign, or give them two or three weeks off and go to Queensland. Yeah. But I know at the moment it's not in the right place because the fields have been too small for too long. I don't know where that conversation sits, though, because I spoke to Jamie McKinnon, who's president of the ATC. He said they want December 31, and I'm not sure that's the right date. There's not many people in Auckland on December 31 for Auckland. Most people, particularly those with a lot of income, leave Greg. They go away. So yet high-end audience you're trying to get to get money through the door or bet don't tend to be there. And I'm going to have him on the show next week, Michael, to yep. talk all things ATC, including yep. where the Auckland Cup carnival has got to. Well, and the other thing, the, uh, the elephant in the room is the money. It's 250 grand, Greg, and that's not enough these days. Now, I know it's not my money, so I can't go spend it for them, but that's not enough to be relevant. If you, we'll use Merlin. If you own Merlin, Merlin has at least seven races on the eastern seaboard or in New Zealand, which are worth at least twice that or more. So he can go Hunter Cups, he can go, you know, the Blacks are fake, obviously Race by Grins, obviously New Zealand Cup, obviously the New Zealand Free for All, the Miracle Mile. When you have all those races and you own a horse, why would you stick around for the Auckland Cup? Because most of those races have to have a lead-up race, like the Cambridge Fly Mile, Greg, yep. to get you into the other race. So if you've got a seven-race campaign based around those better, richer races, 
in seven lead-up races. That's your 14 races for the season. And they're not at the back end of May, and they're not anywhere with 250 grand and a two-mile stand. So there's a whole lot of things which I think we've got a little bit wrong. We've tried it. It hasn't necessarily worked. So let's not be scared to try something else. But I do think, Greg, unless we edge toward four or five hundred thousand dollars, it's going to be not relevant enough to attract the type of horses I believe it deserves, or history would suggest to us it deserves. You had a four-figure bet on a horse, Duchess Megs, it last week. Will you be having one in the Trillion Trust Auckland Cup? I'm going to, I love the race. I love the idea of the race. I'm probably going to have a bet on Old Town Road. I wouldn't be surprised if Self Assured beat him or Mark Shard beat him. Say the old boys could win. I think it's a really, really good Friday night to bet. I've already had, as this show's being recorded, three or four bets, which is a lot of bets for me. I very rarely have three or four bets a night. I've had three or four this week. I think it's a cracky night to bet. And I backed American Me last week too because I just think in lead-up races, if you can be on the leader, as we see in the Kaikoura Cup every year, more often than not, you'll, not, you'll get it right, Greg. So, look, I'll go Old Town Road on top over Self Assured or, or Mark Shard. I think it's all in the mix, depending on who steps really well. Um, I think it's going to be a great story, even if it's not going to be a great cup. How do you see them? Relatively one, two, three-ish in the Trillion Trust Auckland Cup. Yeah, I'm happy to go with the Dickies. I think they can win it with Old Town Road. Uh, I, I just think I self assured. I, I can see this being a fairy tale. If he happened to win it, I reckon they'd retire him straight away. In fact, I think if he finished top three, Gene Feast is that type of person. So I think that's a possibility. Outside of that, yeah, it's a pick and a pug. American me. Um, yeah, where they land. I'd, I'd really like to see Better Eclipse get some money because, uh, you know, he, he's raced well without a whole lot of luck. So, yep, I'd probably chuck him uh, into the mix as well. Yeah, I just wanted to show you Mark Shard. I wanted to show you his trial because he had to tick over trial, beating his stable mate Artisan, uh, 58 to 27 7. So, the old bloke's just loving life, Michael, isn't he? Absolutely no reason he can't win. He'll handle the two miles. The small field plays into his swooping style. He's been pretty good from a standing start. No reason he can't win. He opened the favourite. I can absolutely see the justification for that. He's in that clump of horses, Greg. It's incredibly rare for a harness race at this level that every horse can win. And maybe Republican Party's not going whiz-bang, but even he wouldn't stun me if he won, Greg. So, look, it's not the cup we wanted, but it's the cup we've got. And it's a very even cup, and it actually won't be a bad bidding race. No, absolutely. The next race, now we'll get on to the Reharvest Row Cup. Uh, here was the Anzac Cup from last week, and Muscle Mountain getting it done. He sort of wandered up the track a wee bit here and let Oscar go, well, potentially through the middle, but he wasn't going fast enough to take that gap. Uh, he won like the horse we'd expect to at this level. Uh, obviously, Just Believe will make a big difference this week. It was his 33rd career win, Michael. He's been a wonderful horse, he's just run into a better horse at the moment. And I'm not entirely sure in saying that whether Muscle Mountain's racing at his absolute peak. I'm not sure, Greg, he's absolutely physically, mentally, completely buttoned down and going as good as he can some of those times he won an Ashburton flying mile type race. Um, I think Just Believe will beat him this week. I've got no reason to think that he won't because the last time we saw them compete in a comparable race, the National Trot 2700 metre mobile, so they score up for three or 400 metres. That's a relatively similar stamina rating to a road cup. Just believe set outside him and beat him. I think he'll probably do so again. Now, we know Muscle Mountain. There's nothing we need to tell you about him. He's just a wonderful horse. None of the others behind him on recent runs could possibly run past him. Just none. Oscar's racing like a V8 on six cylinders. This is something not quite sexy about Oscar at the moment, compared with December. He's still pretty good, and I think he'll run top three, Greg. Really. But then you get to Just Believe, and you say, okay, Just Believe, how is he? Spoke to Greg Sugars, horse happy, I'm happy, couldn't be happier with how he worked on Monday morning. Okay, what happens about the standing start? Now, when you look at the stats for Just Believe, he's had six standing starts for two wins and one placing. Of all things, he got beaten in the South Australian Cup at Globe Derby. So you go, oh, hold on. Maybe there's a little chance here for the Kiwis. But let's dig a bit deeper. 
Of those six standing starts he's had, five were with former trainer Mick Hughes when the horse was learning about racing, very much in his infancy, nowhere as strong as he is now and as clean in his gait because he was just a baby going through the grades. He missed away in only one of them. So he's actually trotted away five times out of six. He missed away in his first ever standing start. Since transferring to Jess Tubbs and Greg Sugars, he's had one standing start in the Kilmore Cup in October of 2022, over 3,150 metres, so more or less the row cup distance, and he won. Said to Greg Sugars, is it a concern? No, no concerns at all, totally fine. So Greg, even if we think Muscle Mountain rolls to the front, that's a fair assumption. And even if we think Just Believe thinks, what the hell is going on here, and settles last, if it happens that way. Yep. We saw what happened last time they tried that, three weeks ago. He sat mm -hmm. parked outside him and beat him. It might be harder to do that if he settles last, but he st should still do it. So there's all the facts and figures and things you possibly need to know about the Reharvest Row Cup, which he ends up tipping a dollar thirty chance. Maybe that was a waste of time. Yeah, it does. But we want to learn a little bit more about Just Believe. And luckily enough, our trackside team went out to uh, Stonewall Stud and found out a bit more about the horse and about Greg Sugars and Jess Tubbs. Just Believe. Seeing is believing. Well, Lyle Creek was the best that I've ever seen and he's got to be in the same conversation. He's doing it the hard way, he's not taking the easy trips. Um, he's sitting outside them like Lyle used to and... Uh, Having to take a drive any time Greg wants, just put that out there. And then even to come here and uh, to do what he's doing and to win, win like he did, he's got to be, yeah, right up there, but Sonny's still number one for me. I just had this conversation at home with a lot of people, it's funny anyway. I'll try not to laugh through it. He's in blissful isolation in the Lyle Creek. Just Believe first look. Just Believe came into our stable at the right time, really. Our numbers weren't huge at the time, and the previous trainer was looking to retire and, and move on to a, to another career. So, um, yeah, sort of in the right place at the right time, and, yeah, I'm so glad he did. He'd been a, a well-performed horse up to that point in time, and previous years into Dominion, he was a place getter and ran third that year. So he was a, he was a well-credentialed horse, so we were very excited the day he stepped into our stable. Yeah, my wife Jess Tubbs, um, yeah, who trains Just Believe, she's done an amazing job in her you know, relatively short training career. Her father, Alan Tubb, was a master horseman. Yeah, just learned a lot from him early days, and um, it's only been about seven years ago now that um, she turned her hand to training uh, horses. And um, yeah, so we set up Lara J Farm together, and. Um, she's she's the backbone of the stable. She's first one there, last one to leave every day. And um, yeah, I couldn't be the successful driver that I am without her support and hard work behind the scenes. Yeah, the invitation to Sweden to the Elite Lop was something that we n never thought would be in a situation where we, we would uh, be offered an opportunity like that. So over a year ago now that uh, we had plans to, to bring him across here to New Zealand and uh, yeah we got contacted through ha Harness Racing Australia that the idea was there that if we were interested um, a trip to Sweden uh, could be on the cards for the Elite Lop so that was a pretty exciting phone call to take. Yeah the first heat the Elite Lop the build up was very exciting but it was a lot of unknowns and obviously it didn't didn't go our way uh, right there at a crucial stage but it, we still came off the track looking back at it after the, the emotion of the disappointment was out of it that we were pretty confident that we had a horse then that was capable of mixing it with the horses over there you know if things went well if things had have worked out better for him then we could have uh, been on the dawn of having you know the, the greatest moment of our lives going into an elite lot final but unfortunately this year it wasn't to be yeah the tab trot uh, slot race you know obviously when that was announced uh, we were pretty excited about that and yeah the lead up to the slot race was uh, was quite exciting coming over here with him to hopefully put his best foot forward and show this part of the world what he was capable of was was very exciting and um, you know we were extremely well looked after and guys here at stonewall stud where we stay uh, uh, settled us in really well the barrier draw i think made the race quite interesting the field that it produced was probably as high quality trot field as as we've seen in you know, in this part of the world for a long, long time. So uh, we knew we were going to be up against it and it was going to be a, a tough, um, hard-fought race, which it proved to be. Just believe, though, a true greater than... That was just a real special moment then. Uh, yeah, to cross the line and, you know, you've done the job that you set out to do. Um, you know, it doesn't happen all the time in racing, but uh, when it goes your way in those big races, it's uh, something I'll never forget.
Oh, for Jess and myself, yeah, to win a race like the Road Cup would be pretty awesome, really. Uh, it's probably not something that we'd sort of thought uh, winning feature races and iconic races like the Road Cup in New Zealand it would be something we'd be able to achieve, um, especially at this you know, relatively early stage of our training training careers together. So, you know, when you when you think about champions of years gone by, um, they've all got their names on, on this honour roll. So it'll be pretty special to get this fella's name there if that happens. Yeah, the comparisons um, just believe in Lyle Creek. It, uh, it's something that personally I don't like to do. Um, you know, the, especially it, to compare, you know, any horses, whether they be paces or trotters from from different eras. I think it's extremely hard to do, and some conversations, in a way, can can then come off disrespectful in, in, in some respects to, to certain horses, which I, I think is pretty unfair. Um, I think they're they're both champions in their own right. Their, their record speaks for themselves, and you know, the fact of the matter is that. As, as the years go on, uh, the horses get faster and I think the quality of opposition all gets faster. And so, you know, you can't compare horses on times and things like that, what they were racing. I think we just have to celebrate the, the champions for, for who they are at any given time. And uh, yeah, I'm just happy to be, I suppose, considered um, to have the horse that's, um, you know, anywhere near that calibre. I think Just Believe, uh, it's hard to put into words what he's sort of done for us um, in a way. As I touched on before, there's these sort of races. Uh, I think you know you can say you can dream about being a part of them, but I don't. I don't know if anyone really goes into the training game expecting it's going to happen. Yeah, I've grown up watching the champions as, as as Jess has as well, and you sort of live in awe of those sort of horses. And uh, yeah, to have a horse like him in our stable is, you know, it's a bit of a cliche. I suppose of saying it, it's a dream come true, but uh, yeah, it's he certainly ex exceeded. Um, Expectate all our expectations of, uh, of training racehorses. So it's been terrific to have Greg Sugars here and great insight into uh, so much about him, about Jess and about the horse and we wish them all the best in the Group 1. Uh, let's go on to the third of the big ones, trotting race this one. It is the Trotting Derby. Here was last week's key lead up, Michael, and it was the IRT New Zealand Sire Stakes for the three-year-old trotters. Uh, going forward to the Brecon Farms uh, Northern Derby, this run by Empire City who continues to thrive on racing the winning hour of 7 of 10 starts. Wins this quite nicely Father Barry outstanding Paramount Kiwi, I'm really interested to hear what you've got to say about him, he looked the benchmark but I think she's clearly gone past him Well she went past him after 600 metres Greg because Maddie White handed up and that was the indication to me that he didn't think he could beat her parking her so maybe she's the superior stayer Paramount Kiwi's quite a rangy, typical trotter type of a horse. I wouldn't be surprised if he's just weakening off a touch and he'll be a better horse at the end of the season. He just gives you that impression. But I think this is clearly the best of this crop. Um, on Father Barry, I've got no doubts he's an open class horse for the Dickies. They've got a good horse here and he's bred to be good. And I know it would mean the world to John Dickey after his late friend Richard Bright helped breed the horse. I know that would be a huge deal for them. But back to Empire City, when I watched that and they came home in 60 and 30, I thought, well, she's pretty good, but I'm getting a bit carried away here. I put that to Phil Williamson today and he said, look, she waits for them. The one time she got beat down south, or one of the times she got beat down south, we took the blinds off and she just hated it. And he said, once she waits and they get to her, she goes again. And after the line, she was actually still in front. It wasn't like she was being caught, caught. So we don't know how good Father Barry is. He's pretty darn good. Lucky Mum turns up this week, Greg, and she was really good last week beating the older horses, but she did race Empire City in the Oaks two weeks ago and was beaten fairly and squarely. She'll be advanced on that fitness-wise. Uh, and the rest of them I can't make a case for at all to win. So if I'm thinking Paramount Kiwi, maybe just weakening off a touch and ready for the paddock, put, it, put him back here. Then we're thinking Father Barry, do we really think he'll have the gate speed to get in front and stay in front of Empire City? Probably not. And I'm thinking Lucky Mum will have the gate speed, and if she sits in the trail, ends up being the danger. But she has raced Empire City a couple of times now, and was a very strong second on Grand Prix Day coming from back in the field, but she was never really going to catch her. So I think the 2.5 the bookies put up, Greg, was a real spoil. 
I think she'll start a dollar seventy. Yep, she's into two ten now, and I think that'll continue uh, to tumble in. Um, been a significant week uh, for the Williamsons. Want to show you this race because we lost Majestic Man. Uh, this is him uh, winning the Trotting Flying Mile, the Group One Turf Bar Trotting Flying Mile, and one fifty five eight beating Sunday Sun and Bolt for Brilliance. And yeah, he had a paddock accident, and and unfortunately we lost him, Michael. But he he was just a great horse. Wonderful old fella. Real shame to hear this. It's. He deserved a nice big long retirement with his old mate Monty Python and a couple of other horses knocking around in a big paddock somewhere. But look, they found him. He had passed away in the paddock. It would suggest it was an accident in the paddock rather than a heart attack or anything like that. And um, Yeah, very sad to hear Majestic Man, who gave so many people and such a big syndicate so much enjoyment, passed away. And our thoughts with Phil and Bev and the team and the owners and, of course, Brad. Brad travelled a lot with the horse through COVID and they would have spent a lot of time one-on-one. -on -one. So a huge part of his development as a driver. So thinking of all you guys, because um, yeah, he would have been a wonderful horse to be part of. Yeah, absolutely. The winner of 24 races and over 850,000. A couple of other races we'll quickly have a look at. Magic Dash is going really well. Uh, goes around in race number four on Friday night. And since going north, uh, has showed plenty of ability and did this very comfortably last time, Michael, in the hands of Crystal Hackett. Yeah, had no luck. Cornered up well coming wide, which is hard to do. It's on a pretty tough mark this week, but again, it's only a small field and it's basically the same field. I think Lord Popinjay is going pretty good. It's possibly the danger, and if Maddie continues on with it through the winter, it's a horse who could probably work its way most of the way to open class, as will Magic Dash um, for Crystal, or as we call her, G1C now. Who's driving? Very, very well. Yep, she absolutely is, uh, Michael. Let's go to Always a Porsche, uh, who was outstanding winning the last race last week. Michael, uh, they don't often go better than this. I know you've got to weigh it up against the company that you're up against, and I know you really like one in the race that he has to start off the unruly again, but he powered away. He looks like he's got a future. Well, he's a bit better than most of these. Funny enough, the horse who runs second here, Greg, is a horse I've got my eye on. Uh, sorry, third. Horse around third, here's a horse I've got my eye on. I can too. It's in the first this week. Nice, big, strong horse. It won't be a maiden for too much longer. Back to the winner. Really good performance. Very racy. When you see the under check on, it tends to suggest they've got a few things uh, going on upstairs and things they need to learn. Would suggest he's a three or four win horse without any need to improve too much. But he's up against a horse called Hawkeye Pierce this week. Um, from uh, Logan and Shane's team. Really smart horse, trialled well last week, will improve with that blowout, and yep, he's the one to beat. And, and again, he opened 2.15. Yep. I think he'll close about $1.60. I think there'll be a wave of money for Hawkeye Pierce. Yeah, terrific night there on Friday night. It is uh, Trillion Trust Auckland Cup night and Reharvest Row Cup night. Uh, can't wait to uh, sit on the couch and take in all of that action. We're going to show you a uh, historic Auckland Cup won by Terra to Love for obvious reasons. Uh, and either side of this break, we'll go back and remember this great champion and, of course, his owner. In front on the outside, Terra de Lovers charging after the champion mare. Adore me in front, the glamour boy of New Zealand harness racing, though he's finally going to get what he really deserves in Auckland Cup. And Terra de Love's in. Ricky made a beat out of Dore me. Well, as we know, last weekend uh, we lost uh, one of the greats of our sport in the ownership ranks, Terry McDonald. This was his greatest moment, Michael, his third New Zealand Cup with uh, Terra to Love. You see some great footage post the line. He beat Fly Like an Eagle and uh, Chris and me missed away, as we know, uh, and his performance to win the 2013 uh, New Zealand Cup with the gold cap of Ricky May. There's Graham Court, and to his right, 
Terry McDonald, who just could not believe. Big hug from co-trainer Paul Court. And he passed away uh, Saturday evening, and uh, he had a winner, actually, Michael, on Sunday. And Graham telling me that he went to uh, the hospital, spoke to him and said, how much do you want on tomorrow? No, he said, do you want to have a bet tomorrow? And he said to him, how much? He still loved the punt. He was just... A terrific character, a guy who always had time for for you. He came on radio with us uh, a year to the day. I got him on trackside around about the time Terra won his third cup where he said he wouldn't go on TV. Uh, a fearless punter, a man who, who loved the sport, loved people. And although he came across almost from a different era, almost gangster-like, he had a heart of gold. He had a whole lot of people work for him at Resource. Uh, recycling technologies uh, and prior to that acne metal and drum he's just one of the great characters of life yeah bloody good guy good guy and if you want to test someone's metal as a person give them a good horse because a lot of people get good horses turn into experts and assholes but he was a champion bloke never changed was always the same whether he had stunning color or some rat going around in a race at Timaru which was no good he was exactly the same bloke. And then, of course, he had a horse who won three New Zealand Cups, which is very rarefied here. No, he was a good man. And, uh, yes, very much an old-school bloke. I believe, Greg, we could do with a few more blokes like Terry floating around, to be perfectly honest. Wouldn't do us any harm at all in the modern world. There's Terra, stunning Cullen. Um, Charles Bronson, forgot about him, bad all over. Fellowship. He had a great association with not only Tim, but, of course, but with Graham Court and and Paul Court, and uh, I, I loved that era, Greg. I think it was great fun, and he's the sort of guy who deserved a good horse. He got more than one. Yeah, absolutely he did, and uh, yeah, he'll be farewelled at Addington Raceway, not far from his Terror to Love Lounge, and uh, I think he had 72 individual winners of over 250 races, so a remarkable career as an owner, and like we've just said, uh, just a, a champion bloke. He would have enjoyed this race, Michael, the welcome stakes. It was a bit different, this. 27-3 uh, down the back from the 8 to the 4 meant they got the chocolates got headed by Ribera and... Uh, Malaki, but he came back and got the job done. Uh, first group one, in, or first welcome stakes for the Dunstable, but all for, also for the owners, Ross and Angela Gordon. And speaking to John Dunn post race, he was delighted to be able to do that for them. Congratulations, Johnny. Uh, a really good group one edition of the welcome stakes, wasn't it? What an exciting race. Yeah, it was. It was about gate speed and. Uh Sort of, I fell asleep there in front. And the boys, the boys out wide, Timmy and Stixie, they caught me napping. But uh, picked the bit up again and sort of travelled up on the bit round the bend and, and um, pulled him out. He's actually uh, just got better and better this horse. And uh, great for Roscoe and Angela. This is uh, first Group One, so that's that's a massive thrill for the amount of, amount of horses I've had through the stables. Yeah, that's going to mean a lot to you guys. And good to see Roscoe on track tonight as well after missing last week. But um, when they've been involved in so many horses and for such a long time in the barn, to grab a Group One, extremely special. Yeah, it is special and uh, amazing how hard these Group Ones are to win. Like uh, the amount of horses Roscoe they have the last Roscoe and Angela the last. 20 odd years and uh, finally get it tonight, great thrill. He's come a long way this horse, is there anything left for him? There's actually a half million dollar slot race in Queensland, there might be a bit of interest in him the way he's going, is that of any interest to you? Yeah, I'd love to, uh, good, good money out for grabs over there, but he's come a long way, like you say, come a long way this time in and uh, things are actually looking great back here in New Zealand later half of the season, so um, there's a lot of races here and he's still young. I'd like to get to Brisbane myself too, but uh, we'll, we'll wait for another year. All right. Congratulations, Johnny. Group ones are hard to come by, as you said. Well done. Thanks, that, Greg. So he just keeps on getting better. Michael got the chocolates. Um, not often you see at that level them get crossed down the back and then come back out and beat them. Uh, Ribera, I think he'd come to the end of it, to be absolutely fair. Uh, Malaki is definitely a horse to follow, as is Marketplace, who was running on into fourth position. Well, it was really good. I mean, as you said, to recalibrate itself, get past and then go past them again. But it's not like it clawed its way past them. It just went straight past them. So at the moment, he's the best of those bunch of horses. But you're right, some of those horses are pretty tired. They've been up and down State Highway one a few times. And um, we're talking about this a lot at the moment. We're getting to almost winter when horses used to be spelling, Greg. And there's a lot of horses. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with the calendar. I'm just not sure 
giving all our horses this big winter break and bringing them back and compacting all the races into such small time frames is working. I think it's okay for the older horses to a degree, but man, I've seen a lot of tired horses in the last little bit, not taking away from Got the Chocolates. Really good, thrilled for the owners. The Duns are training up a storm. I, I'm just not sure we're getting to see the best of some of these horses. And, and one thing we're definitely not doing is getting the best Northerners and Southerners together. That just doesn't seem to happen in the first half of the season. Where the answer to that lies, I don't know. All right, and must be getting to the end of the season. I just came up with a new name for Malachi, Malaki. Anyway, we'll move on right from there and uh, have a look at your right, Dahl, taking on the SENZ Trotting Stakes. Roll to the front, got the lead. This is at Group 3 level. Carla Pixie was excellent in second. Michael, uh, Queen Kaizen running on down the outside and the Tony Barron colours gets to third. But your right, Dahl showed us the week before that winning wouldn't be a problem as a two-year-old and now he's won two of three. You know you're getting your, your procedures right and your systems right at work when you're winning Country Cups finals with standing start staying horses and you're winning two-year-old trots and two-year-old paces on the same night at feature race level. There's a lot goes into that. That's a lot of different gearing and a lot of shoeing and a lot of teaching horses different skills. And there's two barns at the moment in this country who are nailing that. Barry Purden and Scott Phelan and Team Dunn. Absolutely nailing it. They've both got good two-year-old trotters who are winning. They've got good two-year-old pacers who are winning. And they've got open class or intermediate grade horses who are winning, Greg. That takes a lot of work, far more work than I possibly understand. And the intricacies of a two-year-old trotter versus... Heisenberg or versus Mark Shard for Perd and Phelan, taking the hopples off them. You have to get a lot of stuff right to have the results those two stables are having at the moment. Yep, they are, and they clearly lead the premiership now, uh, the Diamond Racing team. Here's a horse going to Queensland. Betton wins his name, Michael. We know what you think of him. He's now $2.50 to win the Great Square. Square's the right word. He trots very squarely. And he's matured so much. When you watch him here now, if you ever get bored and you're watching trotting races, slow them down and go frame by frame and see if their legs on a diagonal are hitting the ground at the same time. That's what I like to do when I'm bored because I'm an odd person. But it's fascinating. If a horse is trotting perfectly squarely and their legs on that diagonal are hitting the ground at the same time, that means not only are they well shot and well gated, but they're mature enough to hold their bodies together under pressure. He's just doing it beautifully. Yep. Um, love, love the baby colours. That's a very, very cool element there from the Markhams, uh, or the Markham Whites as they are now. Um, I love this horse. Yep. I've got no doubts he's in the top 10 trotters in the country. And I think by the end of the year, once Just Believe buggers off, he might be in the top five. Yeah, he's won half his races uh, now. Let's move on from him to Ebury Street, winning the Tire General Canterbury Plain Series final. What a good contest it was. Uh, old Santana Mark, he comes down the outside and the 10-year-old runs into second, but uh, Ebury Street actually goes to Addington uh, on Thursday night in race number four. He's drawn the inside back row, so it won't be as easy from there, but Carter Del Getty judged this beautifully, and uh, it was an excellent end to that series, and we've discussed it on this show before. We're going to see more and more of this type of series, and uh, Tom Bamford doing a very good job uh, with his team winning plenty of races. So that was uh, the Canterbury Plains final. Speaking of Addington Raceway, they race on Thursday evening. Here's a fine Patrick finishing third uh, in behind its stable mate. It does go to race number eight on uh, Thursday night, Michael. The uh, Edmonds team, Craig and Amy, do have uh, some really nice horses around them. Uh, of course, uh, I find Patrick finishing third behind four wise women. So, yeah, they're going to have some fun with these horses. Takes on Fight for Freedom, who's uh, trialled nicely. We'll have a look at that trial in a moment. But I find Patrick had to come uh, off the unruly, as it will do again on Thursday night. Yeah, Father Patrick needed a few good horses, Greg. And he's getting some now. He's having a really, really good patch, is Father Patrick. Uh, I think this could be his breakout year, which is needed. He needed good horses to come along, and he's got quite a few of them at the moment. 
Yep, and he is fight for freedom. Uh, who I spoke to Bob Butt about today, uh, he showed plenty as a three-year-old. He said he's trialled really nicely. Uh, as it stands at the moment, he's drawn inside second row. Uh, look, he, he might be able to get out of there. I'm never as worried about the trotters uh, as uh, sometimes with the paces from the stand, but I think he's a pretty good horse. It's, it's a decent sort of a race. George Elliott, last start winner. Uh, Galleon's grandson is also pretty smart. Let's go to the last race uh, on Thursday night, and this horse is trialled nicely. His name is Captain Kobe. Uh, he's actually raced by one of our sponsors, JC International Limited, uh, John Curtin, of course, and the Harness Link link there. Uh, Steve Dolan and his wife Devon combine really smart in this trial, um, beating some handy horses that I think will go on with it. There's another handy horse in it, though, a filly called uh, Dynasty, who uh, Bob Butt trains and John Dunn will take the drive. That should be a pretty competitive uh, final race on the program there. We're about to take our final break on your box seat. Yes, it is brought to you by our stable of sponsors and the stable that have supported us for the last four years. On the other side, we'll have a look at the Timaru Winter Cup and wrap things up as we build towards another massive weekend of harness racing. We go to Timaru on Sunday, it is the Winter Cup. Here was a pretty good performance last time behind, by a horse called uh, Tanzania. I reckon it gets a great chance to win on Sunday. Uh, trained by Lawrence Hanrahan, that's it in the uh, blue and white stripes with the yellow sleeves. Storms home here in behind Warrior Chief who beats Carrera Rapido. This was a really nice performance. Comes in off 10 metres on Sunday in the Pasco the Jewellers Timaru uh, Winter Cup. It's only a small field. Got you covered in there. It's due to get back into some sort of form. The Coleman was second on Sunday at Rangiora, but I reckon uh, Tanzania will go close at Timaru on uh, Sunday. It's already been a winner on the track there as well. As we go across the Tasman uh, with Garrard's, Here's a smart horse, Extreme C, taking out the regional final. Uh, this was at Menangle last week. Homan 54-26 for Brad Hewitt driving for his father, David. Absolutely bolts in. Once we've watched the footage of this, I had a chance to catch up with Brad to talk about this horse and another real smarty he has in his barn in that captain's knock. But... Inside second row draw for it in another $100,000 final this week. That'll make things a challenge. I didn't know that when I spoke to Brad uh, yesterday. And we'll get Michael's thoughts around that uh, once we've heard from a man having a lot of fun at the moment. Well, very kindly joined on the box seat by Brad Hewitt. The family having a bit of a run with Extreme C. Looks a serious racehorse, Brad. Yeah, he's a, he's a beauty, Greg. He's a lovely horse. Let's go back to last Saturday night and the demolition job and the way he did it. Uh, did that come as a surprise to you? The way you eased around the field, took the lead a lap out. He he just did that as if he was in second gear. Yeah, no, it didn't surprise me at all. Like I, I hate to sound a bit arrogant about it, but um, like he's such a a quality horse. Like if anyone that's any run at Wagga, like against them. There were, were a few yeah, top horses in that. Like, they'd been all winning going 149 at an angle. So, um, yeah, the, what he'd done to them that day, it yeah, really pricked everyone's ears. And, yeah, it was no surprise he'd come out and done what he'd done last Saturday. Talk about pricking his ears. He was just just cruising along there, winning by 23 metres, getting home at 26.4. He goes this week to another final, and he looks to have that at his mercy too. Yeah, it's the same thing. You you don't want to be overconfident and sound yeah arrogant about these things, but um yeah, unless something bad happens, then yeah, I can't see how he's going to get beat really. So a family horse that your dad trains and they breed it. I think the mum only had about eight or nine starts and one half of those. So uh, how did this come about, and how exciting is it for the family? Uh yeah, well, it's it's unbelievable for the family. Like dad um always breeds a, a few each year, sort of four or five and been has been done for yeah, his whole life really. And yeah, I, I bred a few as well. But um yeah, she she was a, 
a pretty good mare herself that was just as mad as a cut snake but um yeah then then when he was by well said we had a couple in between that and before we even broke it in i said you might as well get rid of this thing now dad but um yeah he's he's proved everyone wrong and that's why he hadn't raced um until he was yeah sort of late three-year-old he's just taken a lot of getting going and yeah dad's done a really good job on him and he's starting to reward him now all right goes into this final this week is queensland on the radar Probably he'll just yeah, see how he comes through this week and he'll just have yeah, sort of an easy week or two, probably have a, a week or ten days in the paddock and just see how he comes through everything. But um yeah, it's not much of a time to be putting him out in the paddock at this time of year at home and I think the Eureka is only six weeks after the rising sun, so he'll more than likely head there. But yeah, we'll just get a bit of a guide after this week. Let's talk about the Eureka, because not only has he got a slot in that. You've got one with your other horse, Captain's Not. This is going to be an interesting discussion to see who drives which and how that all plays out. I suppose you don't have to worry too much about it now, but, yeah, it's worth asking anyway. Yeah, and I've uh, been trying to avoid yeah, thinking about it. I said to a couple of people, just had, yeah, they last week and this week to get through, hopefully, and, um, yeah, we're worried about it down the track, but it's getting closer and closer and, yeah, sort of still don't know what we're going to do, but um, yeah, we'll, we'll worry about it in another month or so. Yeah, you've got a footballer involved and captain's knock that might knock you around a wee bit if you don't stick with his side. Yeah, well, I've got um, a couple of good mates and that, that um, yeah, like Nathan Jack and Shane Graham, where I go up to in yep. Queensland, and Nathan Jack has driven in before in the, the Derby heat, so I'm sure if, yeah, that's the path we did go down, then um, yeah, they're able replacements, but um, like I said, I still might just driving myself anyway and, and see. We'll cross that path when we get to it. When you get there. Uh, you had a win the other night with ex-Kiwi Typo. He's done a pretty good job. And what have you had him, 15, 16 months now? He's been here about that. And he honestly, I think he ran one bad race and he pulled up crook after it. So he just, he's that consistent and honest. Like He just goes out there and busts his guts for you. Yeah, there's not too many that can go out and sit park going 50 and yeah, still be fighting it out the finish. But, yeah, I, I love the old fella. Yeah, he's won about seven or eight races and 150,000. So uh, he certainly uh, is paying his way. Hey, great to see you, your dad and you and the family have got a, a really nice horse. Can't wait to see what unfolds over the next few months, uh, uh, not only with him, but obviously captains. Not When, when will we see him again? Uh, you'll probably have another trial like in the next yeah, week or two. And, um, yeah, you'll look at stepping out yeah, in about – yeah, three weeks' time, so roughly, somewhere, somewhere around that, in the, within the next month anyway. Nice to have some pretty pretty good horses around you, mate. Must make it a little bit easier getting up on those cold mornings. Yeah, no, that's for sure. Yeah, been lucky. We've got yeah, a few handy ones around us at the minute, and yeah, just can't wait to get them all out and firing again. Good on you, Brad. Thanks very much for making your time available on the box seat, and good luck this weekend and in the future. No worries. Thanks for having me, Greg. So great to have Brad Hewitt uh, on the show. He's a talented young horseman Michael he's got a decision to make around these two horses with the Eureka it does sound like Extreme C will be going to Queensland though which will add a lot to that carnival yep to take on Frankie Ferocious so two very good horses in the rising sun there this is a good horse I think he's in the top five horses in Australia already he won the Wagga Championship now that was the regional final they divide New South Wales into four different regions so he won the Metro final and you said he's on the second line this week in the overall state final. Um, the good news is that means you might get 10 cents more. He might pay $1.30 rather than $1.20, and it absolutely won't matter unless he gets knocked over. He'll just completely spank them. Um, the horses are raced at Bathurst, Newey, and Wagga last week and won their finals aren't in the same class as him. No. Not even remotely close. Good, good horse. Second favourite for the Eureka, which is on first Saturday in September, behind Frankie Ferocious. Frankie's been getting ready for Queensland, but I think this horse might have more top end. Um, Frankie Frocious is pretty darn good, though. They've got some pretty good horses heading for this Eureka already. There's one from WA heading across, Greg. Already, it's shaping as a good race. I doubted the Eureka when they started the concept. I thought, no Kiwis, three- and four-year-olds. Not quite sure how this is going to shake out. It was a ripper last year, and so far, a long way to go, 
shaping up as a bloody good race this year. Yeah, it is. The IRT New Zealand Cup winner Swayze resumes, takes on Nurano. So looking forward to the action out of Menangle on Saturday night. Um, it's also the APC finals uh, out of uh, Melton, but it's Weanling sale time. Michael, 106 going under the hammer at Karaka. Um, gee, there's some, some really richly bred Weanlings, including the very last one, lot 108, uh, which uh, the Brecon Farms team offer. As I get my book out, Michael, uh, Captain Treacherous Colt out of Spandau Ballet. Look, it's a funny sale to sell because it was overpriced a couple of years ago. A couple of the really big players, you think Weanling Harness was as God. You know, half of them look like dogs are that small. And you think to yourself, well, what are they going to sell for? But a couple of years ago, Gene Feast turned up there, Steve Stockman turned up there, and Dean Shannon turned up there. And they all opened their shoulders, and it was yearling prices. It was bizarre. I don't think some of those people will buy this year. I think there'll be chances at Karaka on Thursday. Because when you buy a weanling, you can keep it, right? Or you can take it and pinhook it and put it through the yearling sales. Now, the beauty of that is this. If those big players aren't getting involved and they're not buying horses, they'll need stock come February when the yearling sales are on. But also, I believe Entain's going to get more heavily involved in New Zealand harness racing in the next six months. My conversations with Dean Shannon suggest they want to get involved and they want to fix up what is a stalled product. So there could be more light at the end of the tunnel or the tunnel could be shorter by the time we get to February. So this might actually be a weanling sale that makes sense to buy at economically because I do think the prices might be a bit softer this week than they have been the last couple of years. And I do think there's more bounce potential in the market over the next eight months because of the stuff which we've already seen in the gallops, Greg, but there seems to have been quite a bit of lag as we've been through a administrative funk in harness racing. Um, I believe that lag may soon stop, hopefully. Yeah, hopefully. Uh, Mantra Blue, Ultra Meteor, uh, ultimate racy girl came through this sale so yep some pretty nice horses uh, can certainly do that what's ahead harness racing wise uh, for you around this great nation we'll be at Addington of course on Thursday night a 10 race program there 511 544 for Alexandra Parks a big Trillion Trust Auckland Cup uh, night and uh, Reharvest Row Cup night Winton race on Saturday 11.55 with 10 and that Timaru meeting on Sunday 11.40 uh, for their Winter Cup day Michael it's always a great week Auckland Cup week uh, at Alexandra Park, the field's slightly small in numbers in terms of the big races, but gee, it's a strong undercard and really looking forward to it. Well, funny enough, the fields aren't that much smaller than last year. Yeah. <laughs> they were bigger in the Row Cup, but they weren't much bigger in the Auckland Cup. Look, someone's going to win an Auckland Cup, and that's going to be a fairy tale for somebody, Greg. We'll be here to cover that with our last show of the season next week. Good luck to everybody who's selling or attempting to buy a winning on Thursday. It's a pretty exciting time, Greg. Um, yes, I'm looking forward to seeing what unfolds for us and whether Just Believe can become only the third Australian trotter in the last 50 years to win a Road Cup. Pretty rarefied company. Yep, certainly is. Michael and I will wrap it all up for you in seven days' time. The Box Seat, brought to you by our stable of sponsors. Harness Link for all your worldwide harness racing coverage. Brecon Farms, New Zealand Bloodstock Standard Bread, IRT, it's your horse and our passion, Garrard's Horse and Hound, Lincoln Farms, Renwick Farms, Harness Racing New Zealand, the clubs, Auckland, Cambridge, Addington and Ashburton, and the TAB.